chapter 18, Psalm chapter number 18, we're picking up our series through the book of Psalms and getting back into chapter number 18. We finished up with verse number 19 last time and we're going to jump into verses 20 to 24 tonight. Just going to look at four verses tonight uh, out of the text. We'll be looking at a lot of other verses, but... Um, looking at these first four verses, uh, 20 to 24, actually it's five verses, isn't it? Not four. And so, uh, it's good to be in church and I've, enti- I've entitled the message. He is a rewarder. He is a rewarder. Psalm chapter number tw- uh, 18, man, I'm telling you what, my brain is just all scrambled up. Amen. And, uh, Hallelujah. Uh, let's see here. Verse number 20 of chapter number 18, the Bible says, The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also upright before him, and I kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyesight. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for all that you do. I pray you bless the preaching of your word. I pray, dear God, that you'd fill me, use me, guide and direct my words and my thoughts, Lord. And I pray, dear God, that you would just be glorified and honored tonight through this message. Thank you so much for all that you do for us. I pray you'd work in our hearts and lives and do what's needed. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray, the power of his blood we plead, amen. And so it is really amazing that our God not only gives us the gift of life, I mean, we get to live, and as uh, uh, Brother Lawfer said, uh, we get to breathe air, amen? And uh, and hallelujah, it's free, amen? It doesn't cost anything to breathe air, hallelujah. And so I praise the Lord for that. And, and, you know, we have the gift of life. Then we've been given the gift of a wonderful salvation. Salvation, and uh, and not just a salvation like he saved us and we're going to get to go to heaven, but it's a salvation that gives us a relationship with him, and we enjoy a relationship with the Lord. And then on top of all of those things, he also gives us rewards. He gives us rewards, and really, he gives us rewards for simply doing what really is just really good for us, anyways. By doing right. And, and, you know, and doing right is always right to do because, one, it's best for you. Now, that almost rhymed. That was pretty good. And so, hey, listen, I'm, I'm telling you, it's an amazing thing. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 6, it's a great verse. And, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, the simple fact that we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior is really more than reward enough for the rest of our lives. It really is. But it's amazing to me because we choose to live a righteous life and do right by God that He then also gives us these other rewards that we can have. And so as we look at this and we see in verse number 20, He really does give rewards for good behavior. He really does. It's just amazing that God gives rewards for good behavior. And I'm just thankful for that. And I'm going to ask a question. Now, I promise you this is not belittling or anything like that, so don't take it wrong. Are you being a good boy and girl? (laughs) And so as we look at this, we see this. I want you to notice with me, God rewarded David. And I want you to see God rewarded David, number one, because of his living and his loyalty. Look at verse number 20 with me, if you would, please. Because of his living and his loyalty. Verse number 20. We're just going to look at the verse half of this, and then we're going to jump into 21. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. And so he rewarded him because of his living and his loyalty. Now, when you stop and look at this passage in verse number 20, the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. Now, that word righteous is used in a couple of different ways in the Bible. Righteous simply means right. 
It's really what it means. And righteousness is somebody who is righteous in their living. Now, of course, we know the Psalms is very prophetical of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we can see him all through it. And we know that the true righteousness comes from Christ. And so we know that he was perfect in his righteousness. And so, and we also know because of what it says in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 21, uh, he, became sin, uh, he became sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so we know really as a saved person, it's, at, and I want to explain this a little bit, and I'm getting a little bit bumbly here, but uh, you know, the Bible says in, um, Isaiah talks about that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Now realize that is in reference to salvation. It's in reference to salvation. Nothing that we can do in our own righteousness could ever earn salvation. It's like a filthy rag. And so it's only until after we're saved that we can have our own righteousness. Are you with me? And so, and it's as a result of that. And so as we jump into this, David said, according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, hath he recompensed me. So the first thing I want you to notice, because of his living and his loyalty. And so we see in that passage in that righteousness. And so uh, the way it's broken up in verses 20 to 24, there's a beginning statement in verse number 20, and there's a repeating statement in verse number 24, and there's three verses in between. And now in verse number 20, the first part of that verse, the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. That part of that verse is followed up with verse number 20, 21, and that's how we're going to look at it, okay? The second half of verse number 20 is followed up with verse number 23, and then the middle verse in between those two, which if you're in verse number 21 and verse number 23, the middle one would be? Verse number 22, amen, all right, so you're following me, okay? And so verse number 21, I really want to kind of tune into this a little bit, and it says, for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. And so because uh, David, God was able to reward David because of his righteousness, and down that righteousness is talking about two things. It's talking about the way he lived, he lived rightly, And secondly, it's talking about his loyalty. And we see that in verse number 21. Look at it with me. And so we see in this verse once again, it says, For I have kept the ways of the Lord. In Psalm chapter number 58, verses 10 and 11, The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that a man shall say, Verily, there is a reward for the righteous. Verily, he is a God that judgeth in the earth. And so when we look at that verse, now David in this passage is talking about victory over his enemies. And that is the reward he is he is pointing at as he has been rewarded with this victory over his enemies. Because David recognized a long time ago that he couldn't defeat his enemies on his own. He needed God to do that. And now there's all kinds of enemies in our lives today. Though we may not have people and nations, well, we do have nations rising up against us, but as Christians, we don't have like a a, a non-Christian group that would be like trying to attack us necessarily with swords and shields and, and that kind of thing. Now, there's a lot of attack in other ways through legislation and all of that stuff that's going on around us today. But as we look at this, we have enemies. We have enemies, which is the flesh, which is the devil, and which is the world. These three things are the main enemies in our life. And I would dare say that you are probably your worst enemy. Can I get a witness? That is the truth. And so as we jump into this and look at this, 21, for I have kept the ways of the Lord. He had righteousness because he kept God's ways. And so righteous living, listen to this, this is the first point under number one, righteous living isn't based on opinions. Righteous living isn't based on opinions. It's based on God's ways the ways of God. Psalm 128, verse number one, blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord that walketh in his ways. 
God has a set of ways that we're to walk in, and we have those ways in the Word of God. And so we have to walk in God's ways. We have to stay and keep the ways of God. And so in that is what brings righteous living. It's not based on an opinion whether you think it's right or not. 1 Thessalonians 2.10 says this, You're witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. And so Paul talking here to the church of Thessalonica and his companions, he was talking about himself and his companions, he said, you have seen how we behaved ourselves, that we were holy, we were just, we handled ourselves appropriately according to the ways of God. 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 15, Paul speaking to Timothy, and he says in verse number 15, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And so he is telling Timothy here, you need to know how to behave yourself in the house of God. There's a way that we should behave ourselves in God's house. There's a way we ought to behave ourselves amongst believers. And there is definitely a way we need to behave ourselves when we're amongst the lost. And so as we look at this, we see this, that listen, righteous living isn't based on opinions. Our living should line up with God's word. Proverbs chapter number 16, verse number two, all the ways of man are clean in his own eyes but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Are you with me? Now, when you stop and and, and just ponder on that for a minute, we have a really good, we just really are good at rationalizing for ourselves. (laughs) We're really good at justifying the way we live. We just are. And listen, every one of us is good at this. Every one of us is good at justifying what we watch. Every one of us is good at justifying what we spend our money on. Every one of us is good at justifying where we spend our time. Every one of us is good at justifying what we put in our bodies. Every one of us is good at it, amen? Every one of us is good at justifying how we live. Mrs. Frost always makes this statement. It just makes me hot mad, I'm telling you. I just get fire mad when she says this. Christians do what Christians... Christians make right what Christians want to do. And I'm just like, oh, I hate that because I don't want that to be me. But the truth is, is there's a whole lot of truth in that statement. And we do. We are good at making right what we want to do. And man, I just, I just, you know what it makes me want to do? It makes me want to throw up. I just want to puke all over the place. Ah, I hate that. But it's true. And I, have to, and I have to tell myself, hey, you do it too. And I'm just like, Ugh. but I don't even like to admit it to her. I'm like, no, nope, no, that's not true. We argue about it. <laughs> and so anyways, righteous living isn't based on opinions. It's based on the word of God. Hosea chapter number 14, verse number nine. Who is wise? And he shall understand these things. Prudent, and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. And the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. Righteous living isn't based on opinions. David was blessed. David got rewards because it says in verse number 21, for I have kept the ways of the Lord. Haggai chapter number one, verse number seven, it says this basic statement twice in this chapter. It says, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And tonight I want you to stop and think and consider your ways, the ways of your life. Righteous living isn't based on opinion. Secondly, under point number one, loyalty isn't based on words. Loyalty isn't based on words. Look at this, verse number 21. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. Now, I want you to notice the wording in that a little bit. And have not wickedly departed from my God. Okay, that doesn't mean David didn't mess up. 
And so, and I know the prophecy, and this is kind of what makes me think, okay, we're back. Maybe that first statement, my righteousness, I've been rewarded because of my righteousness, was a reflection of Jesus Christ. And you can see Jesus Christ all through the Psalms. But this statement right here makes me think, okay, this is really talking about David. I have not wickedly departed from my God. Because the truth of the matter is, in ways in our lives, we do depart from God in ways. When we choose what we believe is right versus what the Bible says is right. Are you with me? And so we do these things. Loyalty isn't based on words. Loyalty obviously is based on actions. And it says in verse number 21, and have not wickedly departed from my God. First John chapter number two, verse number 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. First John chapter number 2, verses 19. And the truth of the matter is, is, is when we look at this and we see in what it says in verse number 21, and have not wickedly departed from my God. And so... When we would do things that would be considered to be wicked according to the Word of God, that is being disloyal to God, and that is departing from Him. And now, would you agree that it would be disloyal to depart from God? Would you think that's right? I, I think that's right. When I stop and think about that, this is a matter of loyalty. And, and David was loyal to God. And he stood with God. Now, he made his mistakes, just as we all do. But this matter of loyalty to God and his program. 1 Samuel chapter number 15, verse number 11, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. Well, we looked at this passage last Wednesday night. For he is turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel. And he cried unto the Lord all night. I can relate with Samuel. been there many times. And look at this, 1 Samuel 15, 11, it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he turned back from following me. Saul became disloyal to the Lord God of heaven. Are you with me? He became disloyal. He turned back. Luke chapter number 9, verse number 62, and Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Does that mean they lose their salvation? Nope just means they're not fit for the kingdom of God. And listen, there's, hey, listen. Uh, think about this. Do I look like I'm fit to run a, a 5K race today? I could do it, but man, I'm telling you what, by the time I cross the finish line, I'd probably be like half dead. And so anyways, listen, but you know, I, I'm definitely not running a marathon anytime soon. 25 miles, you're going to swim five miles, you got to run five miles, you got to walk five miles, you got to bike five miles. I don't think so. And so listen, are you with me? I'm not fit for it. Doesn't mean that I'm not going to, that I couldn't, that I couldn't finish it. I just wouldn't be, in, I'm definitely not going to win. I'm not going to come across that line first. I'm most likely last. And so are you with me? So it's not talking about salvation. It's talking about being in shape for, fit for. And so why? Because what do you do when you look back? Well, when it comes to the things of God, when you're looking back, it's because you're going back into the world you used, you came from. You know what I'm saying? And so as we look at this and we see, we see in this passage, this matter of loyalty isn't based on words, it's based on actions. Mark chapter number 8, verse number 38, whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. That is some strong language. Let me ask you, have you ever been afraid to speak up for Jesus? You, you heard what I, it's Mark chapter number 8, verse number 38. That's strong language. When I get to heaven, I don't want God to be ashamed of me. 
because I was ashamed of him. I was too embarrassed to talk or too afraid to speak up for my God. So we see here that God rewarded David because of his living and of his loyalty. Secondly, I want you to notice with me verse number 20, the second half of that verse in verse number 23. We see God was able to bless David because of his living and his loyalty, but also because of his purity and his poise. His purity and his poise. Look at verse number 20 once again with me. And according to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. And that word recompense means to be rewarded. And uh, so he's basically saying he's rewarded twice and he's giving two different reasons why he's rewarded. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. Now when the Bible talks about the cleanness of hands, it is speaking about purity and holiness. Okay, And so we see, now look at verse number 23. I was also upright before him, and I kept myself from mine, what? Iniquity. And so there's a couple of points under this. The first point I want you to notice, under, because of his purity and his poise, is because cleanness requires cleansing. Cleanness requires cleansing. Listen, being pure doesn't mean you don't ever sin. Impossible. I promise you, however many days of your life you're going to live, every single one of those days you are going to sin. You're going to sin every one of those days, somehow, some way, and in, 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 in a lot of ways you won't even know what you're doing this sin. Are you with me? But purity doesn't mean perfection. Cleanness requires cleansing. 1 John chapter number 1. Let's just look at these verses. Go there. I want you to look at them. Turn in your Bibles. 1 John chapter number 1. You know this passage. You know this passage. Now, I'm heading somewhere pretty quick. The third point's a real humdinger. What? Humdinger? I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to rattle your cage, brother. <laughs> it's going to ring your bell. And so as we look at this, verse number 9, if we what? Confess our sins. You know, this is so simple. We've heard it so many times. But it requires a couple of things. It requires humility and it requires desire. You've got to want to be clean. You've got to want to be right with God. And you got to be willing to admit, you know what, i got problems. And it would be a good idea for me to figure out what they are and get them right. It says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we see here in this passage, we see this matter of confession being a part of cleanness requires cleansing. Now back it up to verse number 7. Verse number 7 of that same chapter. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the what? We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, what? Cleanseth us from how much sin? All sin. Now, I like that verse. And you'll notice that that verse was put before the verse we just read. Now, 7 is before 9, amen? And so listen. And the reason is, and I believe this to be the case, that when we are endeavoring to walk in the light, those sins that we do not know are being cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Are you with me? Keeping us clean and right with Him. Are you tracking? And now we get past this next point. He says, if we say that we have no sin, oh, you blew it. <laughs> and he goes on to say, confess those sins. The ones you know about, confess. The ones you don't, I'm going to take care of those. Are you with me? He doesn't expect you to be omniscient. He's omniscient. He knows all. Amen? Now, can stop and just chew on that for a while and think about how good God is to us. 
What a tremendous blessing that God does those things for us. Amen. Cleanness requires cleansing. Psalm chapter number 24, verses 3 and 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. And one of the things, if somebody's going to serve God and going to stand for God and do God's work, they've got to have clean hands. Hands. They've got to be pure. And you know as well as I know to have clean hands, listen, you've got to confess your sin. And you know what? You've got to walk in the light. And so we see in Psalm 26, 6, I will wash mine hands in innocent, so will I compass thine altar, O Lord. So you're going to have clean hands. You're going to have to be around the Lord God of heaven and earth. And then we see in Titus chapter number 2, verse number 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. I'm thankful that our God is in the purification business. Amen. And so praise be to God. So we see here in this passage, we see the first point under his purity and his poise, the cleanness requires cleansing. Secondly, self-control requires subjection. Look at verse number 22, second half of that verse in our text. And it says for all of uh, verse number, well, I'm sorry, verse number 23. And it says, uh, I, will, I was also upright before him and I kept myself from mine what? Iniquity. From mine iniquity. I kept myself from what? Mine. Mine. Every one of us in here should be able to point at things in our life and say, yeah, that's mine. That's the one I struggle with. That's my besetting sin. That's my problem, child. That's what I'm dealing with. But see, self-control requires subjection. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse number 27, Apostle Paul put it best. He says, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. I beat this flesh to submit. That's what we have to do. We have to have enough self-control, and that requires subjection. It requires me beating myself under self-control. And you know, I'm not talking about like um, Martin Luther on the, the, the steps of the Catholic Church in, I don't remember the place, and he would take and he'd crawl up and down those steps and he had a whip and he'd beat his back until he was bloody. He's beating his body. That is not what that's talking about, amen? And <laughs> it is talking about you getting your flesh in control. You don't have to, listen, and then there's these, these people over in the, the Philippines and other places, they're nailing themselves to the cross, and I'm just sitting here thinking, these people are just absolutely brainwashed by Satan. I mean, it's a mess. You don't have to nail yourself to a cross to get right with God or to relate with Jesus. You know, like the Apostle Paul said, and we just looked at it, Philippians 3.10, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering. I've got to go nail myself to a cross so I can understand his suffering. That's not what he's talking about, okay? He wants to understand his, his fellowship of his suffering, and Paul did by living for him. There was plenty of enemies out there that helped him to understand the fellowship of Christ's suffering. And so we see this. Romans chapter number 8, go there with me. Romans chapter number 8, don't lose your place in Psalms. Romans chapter number 8 in your Bibles. Romans chapter number 8, verse number 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall what? But if ye through the Spirit Spirit, through the what? Now, in my Bible, that's a capital S. The Spirit of God. Do what? What does mortify mean? Make dead. Kill it. The deeds of the body. Ye shall what? Live. 
And so we see in this passage, you know, self-control requires subjection. You've got to mortify your body. But you're going to, be, listen, you can't do it on your own strength. This, this uh, uh, power of positive thinking, you can positively think about all you want to think about. But it's not going to change the fact that this body desires to do wrong. This flesh, the old man that lives inside of me, which is still there, still alive, is trying to get me to do wrong. And you've got to mortify the deeds of the body. And the more you push and beat and, and push down, all of us, you know, there's things early on in my Christianity that I struggled with bad. And you know what? I don't even hardly give them a thought anymore because I just kept on pushing it down and pushing it down and pushing it down. Now, there's some other things that I would really like to continue to push down, but every day they just seem to haunt me. And they taste so good. And so anyways, listen, as, as we look at this, this self-control requires subjection. Colossians chapter number three, verse number five, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil confusions, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Mortify therefore your members, put it to death. Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And so you've got you to kill it. you just got to kill it. And it takes time to kill it. And you've got to do it in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the what? Lust of the flesh. Galatians 5.24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And what does it say over in Colossians? Set your affections on things above and not things on the earth. Amen. And so we see uh, uh, God was able to bless or uh, reward David because of living and loyal, because of his living and his loyalty, because of his purity and his poise, which poise simply means self-control. How did David manage this? Well, we see this in verse number, that middle verse, verse number 22. We see it in verse number 22, and we see it at the end of verse number 24. Go back to our text, Psalm chapter number 18. Look at verse number 22. For all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. For all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. And so we see here, because of what he placed before him, and what he would not put away from him. That's how he could live the way he lived, stay loyal to God, be pure like he was supposed to be, and be poised in his self-discipline because of what he placed before him and what he would not put away from him. And what we see here, the first thing under point number three, he would not forget he would not forget. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter number 6 with me. Deuteronomy chapter number 6. He kept the judgments of God before him. He kept the judgments of God before him. You've got to see this. He kept the judgments of God before him. He didn't say the Word of God. He was specific about what part of the Word of God. He said the judgments that's where God judges. If you do this, I'm doing this. Are you with me? He kept God's judgments before him. And if you'll keep the judgments of God before you, I'm thinking that's going to help to remind you that if you decide to let your flesh have this desire, the Bible says this is what God's going to do. Are you with me? Amen. And I'm thinking that's probably going to help you a little bit Amen. with maybe bringing this body into subjection. And so as we see in this passage, we see in Deuteronomy chapter number 6, pick it up in verse number 4 with me. This is the great commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, 
And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, the word of God. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Did you notice that's every part of your day? All 24 hours right there. And it's the word of God is supposed to be all around you all the time. And look at what it says in verse number eight. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. In other words, you use your hands to do a lot of stuff. Are you with me? And he's saying, bind it on your hands. You need to be reminded while you're doing what you're doing through the day about God's word. And and that kind of shows that how quickly we forget and how easily we're pulled away. Look at this now. And then in the second half of verse number eight, and they shall be as what? Frontlets. What does a horse have on it to keep it from? It's got frontlets on it. Now, and they're on the sides of the eyes to keep that horse, and you can turn it and steer it by pulling the reins, right? Now, notice what it says here about the frontlets. It says, and they shall be as frontlets what? Between thine eyes. In other words, I don't want you to have them out here and have all this view. I want it to be right here, and I want you to be cross-eyed for Jesus Christ. Amen. I want your focal point to be right there, one spot, one thing, be focused on it. And that's going to keep you right. Are you with me? And it goes on to say, write it on the post of thy house and on thy gates and all that. The Word of God is supposed to be everywhere in your life, so it helps you to remember And so he would not forget. He had the judgments of God before him. And he didn't just say some of the judgments. He said all the judgments. And so having those before us will keep us. Listen, you know, one of the judgments of God says, and behold, if you will not do so, you have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. There are sins in your life that you would be so embarrassed and ashamed of if people found out about them. Right? Maybe you ought to have that verse floating around to kind of keep you in memory of it. Because God says, listen, if you'll not do so, you've sinned. And be sure your sin's going to find you out. You will be discovered. It will come to knowledge. And how, how, how horrible that would be. Hebrews chapter number 2, verse number 1, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Remember. And the best way to remember is keep it before you all the time. And that's what David did in Psalm chapter number 18. He said in verse number 22, For all his judgments were before me. And then secondly, and I did not put away his statutes from me. And so then we see here, he would not pick and choose. He would not pick and choose what he was going to obey. He did not pick and choose what commandment or what statute, what statue, the, the, the statutes that, you know, and, and you know what, uh, you think about it like this, because of the law of what? Statue of what? limitations. And statutes were there for limitations. It put boundaries around us. Are you with me? It put these boundaries around us to protect us. He did not, listen, he did not say, I'm going to take some of the statutes and and leave some of the others. No, he wouldn't put them away from him. He heard the statutes and he kept them. He kept them and kept them and kept them. He didn't pick and choose what he was going to obey and not obey. He wasn't like that. He chose to obey what God said. And if God says it, that what? Settles it, amen. We ought to obey it. He would not pick and choose. Psalm 119, verse number 112 says, I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always, even unto the end. 1 Kings 8, 58, that he may incline our hearts unto him to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes. Man, the statutes of God are so vitally important for our own protection. 
Don't cross those lines because there's danger on the other side. Philippians 2, 13, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. God brings these things into your heart and into your life for a reason. And it's no mistake that you're here tonight. Psalm 119, 117, Hold thou me up, and I shall be safe, and I will have respect unto thy statutes continually. He would not pick and choose. And then lastly, I want you to notice in verse number 24, he knew who his rewards were coming from. He knew where the rewards were coming from. Look at verse number 24. Therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in His, say it with me, eyesight. He recognized his rewards came from God, and it was in his eyes. He wasn't doing right in his own eyes. He was doing right in the eyes of God. He knew who his rewards were coming from. He wasn't, he wasn't getting the rewards because of the way he saw things. Are you getting what I'm saying? He was getting rewards because of the way he sees things. Can I get a witness? And so this is so vitally important. It wasn't about picking and choosing. He kept the judgments, all of them, before him. And he knew where his rewards were coming from. Judges 21, 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Don't be one of those. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, you know it. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy paths. Listen, God put everything in this book for a reason. This book, He didn't write this book down for His own memory. Are you with me? He wrote this book to us so that we could know Him. And we could know what He expects of us and what He expects us not to do. Are you with me? And boy, in this passage right here, He's watching us. And those rewards that come from Him is because of what He sees, not because of how I see. Amen? Amen. I'm thankful that God sent His only begotten Son to die for our sins, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. I'm thankful for the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that I'm a child of God and that I'm saved. And I don't know about you, but I want to hear someday, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And you know what? If you're sitting in here under the sound of my voice, say amen. Amen. You can still hear that. Maybe you've struggled. Maybe you've messed up. Maybe... Maybe you're living a double life. Maybe you're doing things in the background and you're faithful to church and you're all this. You can get those things squared away. You don't have to say amen at church and speak other ways at home. Listen, I want to invite you tonight to examine yourselves. Consider your ways. Stop looking at things through your own eyes and start looking at it through the eyes of God and doing things the way He wants you to do them. Hey, listen. You can mortify the deeds of the flesh. You can put down those things that are hindering you. You can have victory. And listen, maybe you have wickedly departed from the Lord and you've been disloyal to Him. You know what? You can get those things right. I'm glad that God cleanses us of the things we don't even know of by the power of His own blood. And I'm glad that the things that we do know of, that we can confess and He'll cleanse us from those too. Amen? You can leave here tonight completely 100% right with God. And I hope that you'd have a desire to do so. Everyone standing, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If God spoke to your heart tonight, would you slip your hand up as a testimony to heaven? God sees those hands.
Father, we sure do love you. We praise you. We thank you for all that you've done for us. You're an awesome God and a powerful God. Thank you for, you are just so good. Thank you for your love, your care, your compassion. Thank you that you've given us a book that we can see and look into and understand. That you've written it to us so that we might know you and know what you expect. And Lord, you've just poured out so many benefits and blessings and rewards in our lives. You just have, and it's just incredible to me. Your mercy is everlasting. Your compassions, they fail not. Your faithfulness endureth forever. You're an awesome God. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to love and honor you and do our best not to do things that right in our own eyes, but do them in your eyes. Do what you see as fit and right. I pray you'd help us and strengthen us now. Work and move as only you can. I pray you bless this invitation. Help each one of us to be obedient to your spirit. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray. The power of his blood we plead. Amen. If God spoke to your heart, you come on. You come on. Take the front row if you can't kneel. Take that step. Come on. Come on. Let God have his way. Humble yourself. If you can kneel, get around the altar. Talk to God. Don't leave this place not right with God. Get a hold of the Lord. Let him have his way. He is a rewarder, amen.